family is the most important thing. Don't do what I did. I put work in front of family. This is the last one. So help me God. You're always searching for new obstacles to play, for new drama to portray. Once in a while, somebody puts a story out that you get interested in, and this was very different from anything I've ever done before. How did you come into all that money? Well, I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm a high-end gigolo. Seriously, come on. I'm a drug mule for the cartel, and I've got 305 kilos of cocaine sitting in the back of my truck. Clint worked with Nick Shank on Green Tree Note, and he goes, I loved working on Green Tree Note. I wonder if Nick Shank has anything. And somebody was listening upstairs because Nick called. When I read the script, I'm like, I can only see Clint playing this character. There was no one else. At first, he was playing a little coy, like, I don't know who we're going to get to play this character. And we're like, come on, Clint. Like, this is made for you. It's an unusual story, inspired by true events, and it makes him a perfect guy to be the mule rather than somebody who looks suspicious. Pretty soon he's living kind of a crazy life. Certainly for a person his age, I've always tried to look for something new that taxes the brain a bit, and this one did for me, as did Gran Torino, which was interesting because it was also a guy who was older, but Walt Kowalski just wants peace and quiet. And this guy loves the road and excitement of road, and he loves to meet people and interact with people, but they both, in the long run, they come up to the same thing, is they change. Don't let the old man in. I like there's something naive about him, yet there's something adventurous. He almost becomes like a Robin Hood character because he makes all this money unlawfully, but he goes around and starts helping people that need things. Clint really breathed life into this thing. He was very hands-on and very thoughtful about how it's going to be different than everything else he did. Usually his roles have some kind of control or a shotgun or power. This guy's really losing control and he tries to cover it up with jokes. A real pain in my ass, you know that? Come then go see a proctologist. He's able to slip into and be free with his own sense of humor in the character. Very dry, very mischievous. Oh, He's yeah. very dangerous. Gorgeous, yes. She looks dangerous. Yes. We had a scene the other day where the hearse is driving off. He starts cracking jokes. And we're all sitting there supposed to be crying. And he's got a great sense of humor. He's just a very unique individual. It was nice working with a member of your family, but once in a while I'd hear her call out dad, and I'd think, what do you want? And we're, oh, well, that's right, we're working together. I've really seen him find a new rekindled romance with acting, which is really lovely for someone his age to look like a kid in a candy store. Ladies, uh, you're on the wrong floor. Third floor is the beauty pageant. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it just seems like the perfect role for the perfect actor at this time of his life. The funny thing about Clint is he had to play as if he was older because he's so virile. <laughs> and he like gets out of a chair like a kangaroo, but Earl doesn't. To see Bradley Cooper and Clint Eastwood on the big screen and working together, it's fun to see the chemistry that they have, and they have so much respect for each other. You know, I learned so much from Clint, and particularly because he's an actor-director. He expects you to know your lines and know your character and deliver on the first take, so you really have to deliver. And one of the best scenes in the movie is in the Waffle House, and just watching the two on camera together, just looking at each other and admiring who the other person is, it just gives you shivers watching some of these scenes. You lived so long, I think you probably yeah. lost your filter. I never realized I ever had one. There were two times on the set where I just couldn't stop crying watching him work, even when I was in a scene with him where my character certainly should not be crying. <laughs> so I had to like walk away. He's a very intelligent actor, and if he likes a script, he puts his all into it. I'm a king of missing anniversaries. That's oh, yeah? the problem, yes. That's the first one I've missed, so. One of the toughest things production-wise was a daylily farm. So our production designer and our art director were going through fits because they only bloom one day and then they're gone. But in order to get the bloom to come back the next day, you have to pluck all the flowers off. So the night before we shot, the flowers were completely gone. And the next morning, they actually open up. You can imagine my stress. And he didn't tell Clint that till after it happened. Clint had a big smile on his face, and we knew with the Eastwood luck, everything was going to turn out fine at the end of the day. It's one of those stories you have to have the small things, because it's a conglomeration of small items that go together that make the total. Down here, yeah, that's it. Cut. 
Thank that, baby. You can see that he has an eye for detail. You can see that attention is paid to things that are quite small, but also give authenticity and depth and clarity to the storytelling. Not quite so tip back. It's like it's come right through. Mike Sexton he had this one technical advisor that knew about stash houses and everything. I get a lot of authentic information and ways of doing things to make it look as good as we can possibly make it to make it real. Bricks of cocaine made into kilos, exact 2.2 pounds per kilo, smashed, pressed, done exactly like they would do in real life. What do you got? Freight manifest. He's delivered 121 kilos in April, 172 kilos in May. In our script, it calls for these little log books that these guys keep. What is this, code? Yeah. Symbols for each of the mules, along with symbols for their routes, dates. For that, we applied the little icons and driving routes and amounts of cocaine that we're carrying to what would be a real log book. Clint pays attention to those things, and that's what's so exciting about working with a master like that. People have taught me a lot about the drug trade and a lot about the mule, so to say, carrying cross country from Mexico to all different states. It's just like the movie depicts. Don't look in that bag. You might think you can identify us, but don't forget, we know who you are. Clint's always a stickler to try to get it as realistic as possible. When we're putting that truck together, one of the things that he said, he wanted it to be a piece of shit because, you know, it's telling a specific story about his character and the socioeconomic level that he's at. As I was aging the vehicle, wasn't sure if I was going too far, and I looked into his eyes when he saw it for the first time. I go, wow, am I going to get the dirty, hairy stare? You know, he goes, wow, Kevin, you know, that really is a piece of shit. I don't think anybody would like it. And to this day, I don't know if that was accepted. But you know what? He went right in that car, started performing, so I figured I got it. It's funny, it's like when you talk and you have discussions with Clint, you have to read his performance. It's not only what he says, but it's those small body language that's it's telling you if he's accepting what you're doing or if he's scrutinizing what you're doing. And he expects excellence out of all of us. It's a road movie, so we're opening up the film quite a bit more than we've done in some of the other films. We wanted to get the broader scope of the picture and see the mountains and see all these great vistas. We did a three-day road trip at the end of the film with Clint driving in both of his pickups, Chevy pickup and his new Lincoln pickup. When you see the movie, you just see this truck going through some beautiful environment. What you don't see is the 15 vehicles and the camera truck and all these people that were driving with them to support them and in all aspects, you know, wardrobe, makeup, hair, camera, grip, lighting, etc. We started him along the route and ended up going throughout New Mexico through Colorado and on our way up towards Chicago. And for three days, he was driving the pickup and singing his songs. It has been a lot of fun putting the movie together because there are so many looks. The cartel, so I had to do research, obviously, on the cartel, the DEA, and the look for Earl. And his clothes obviously have to be clothes it looks like he's had for a while because of the movie clothes that we've collected over the years of working with Clint. We decided to use a lot of the existing clothes from other movies. He has clothes as far back as true crime. And when he was wearing everything, I would say, oh, this is from Gran Torino. And he was getting a big kick out of it. He wears a suit at the end when he is eventually busted from in the line of fire. So it's basically a resume of all his movies displayed in his clothes. I've had a lot of fun with that because he would come out of his bus and go, where's this from? <laughs> what movie is this from? He enjoyed that, and I did too. I always like stories where there's conflict or there's some obstacles to overcome. You have to think about different elements as you're putting them together. But basically, is did you emotionally transfer what you were trying to do over to the audience?
this film. It had humor, it had drama, and a very interesting character. We all have obstacles to hurdle in life, and he pushes the envelope. I thought it was more important to be somebody out there than failure I was here in my own home. I'm sorry for everything. <laughs>